a very good evening aspirants i welcome you all to the daily hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by shankar ais academy for the date of 23rd of may 2023 displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today now without wasting any time let us get into our discussion this text and context article is about the ongoing tussle between the delhi government and the lieutenant governor of delhi few days back that is on 18th may to be exact kirtana ma'am discussed about a hindu article titled two judgments and the principle of accountability in that she discussed about the may 11th judgment of the supreme court regarding the control of civil services in new delhi through this judgment the supreme court introduced the concept of triple accountability and reduced the powers of lieutenant governor in regards to his control over civil servants in national capital territory there is an update in this matter on 19th may the president passed an ordinance to negate the 11th may judgment of the supreme court this ordinance brought the lieutenant governor to the forefront in regards to the control of civil servants in national capital territory it is in this context that this text and context article is written this article focuses on the rational behind the supreme court's may 11th judgment the 19th of may ordinance passed by the president and the conflict between the ordinance and the supreme court judgment and finally the failure of the judgment in our discussion today we will see about all these points in detail but before getting into the discussion i have highlighted the syllabus regarding this discussion here you can go through it first let us start with the may 11th judgment of supreme court due to the unique nature of new delhi there has been a constant tussle between the lieutenant governor and the delhi government the lieutenant governor acts in the interest of union government this tussle exaggerates when the political party in power in new delhi is different from the political party in power in the union government the recent tussle is in regards to the accountability of civil services in nct the delhi government is saying that the civil services is accountable to the delhi cabinet and the lieutenant governor is saying that the civil services is accountable to him and in turn to the union government this matter was taken to the supreme court to strike a balance between the national interest and the authority of an elected delhi government the supreme court said that the delhi government has control over bureaucrats in civil service in all spheres except the bureaucrats in three specific areas that is public order police and land the bureaucrats in areas like public order police and land are accountable to the lieutenant governor and not the delhi government through this the supreme court tried to strike a balance but what is the rational behind the supreme court arriving at this decision firstly the supreme court said that the executive power of delhi government was coextensive with its legislative power delhi is not a full fledged state the demarcation of power between the elected government of delhi and the central government is mentioned in the article 239 aa of the indian constitution according to the article 239 aa the legislative assembly of the new delhi is constitutionally interested with the power to make laws upon the subjects in the state list and concurrent list except those relating to public order police and land based on this only supreme court said that since the legislative assembly of the new delhi has such powers then the delhi government which represents the executive arm of delhi will also have control over all the bureaucrats in civil service except the bureaucrats in three specific areas as we saw earlier that is public order police and land secondly supreme court while pronouncing this judgment mentioned about the concept of triple chain of command in the triple chain of command civil service officers are accountable to ministers and the ministers are accountable to the legislature and the legislature is ultimately accountable to the electorate that is the voters so in this case of delhi it is only natural that the bureaucrats are accountable to delhi government who are accountable to delhi legislature and who in turn are accountable to the people of delhi thirdly supreme court through this judgment reiterated the judgment of the constitutional bench in the 2018 government of nct of delhi versus union of india case in 2018 the constitutional bench of supreme court held that although new delhi is accorded the status of a state the concept of federalism would still be applicable to it the court went on to say that the lieutenant governor of delhi had no independent decision making powers was bound to follow the aid and advice of the delhi chief minister headed council of ministers on all matters except those pertaining to police public order and land the 11th may judgment of the supreme court reflected this opinion of the constitutional bench these are the three rational behind the recent supreme court judgment and through the 11th may judgment the supreme court tried to create a neutral civil service in delhi as i mentioned on 19th may the president passed an ordinance to sideline the supreme court judgment before we see about the issue with the ordinance let us first see the provisions of the ordinance 
the ordinance seeks to create a permanent national capital civil service authority that is nccsa this is a three member body the chief minister is the chairperson of the body and the body also has chief secretary and principal home secretary as member and member secretary now we we'll look at the responsibilities of nccsa the nccsa decides on matters relating to transfers postings prosecution sanctions disciplinary proceedings vigilance issues etc of civil service officers deputed to delhi government department except those in public order police and land how does the nccsa arrive at a decision the decisions in the nccsa would be taken with a majority of votes of the members present and voting but when there is a clash of opinion between the nccsa and the lieutenant governor of delhi then the decision of the lieutenant governor takes precedence and will prevail so basically through the ordinance and through the creation of nccsa the union government is trying to bring power back to the lieutenant governor of delhi now what are the issues with the ordinance firstly through the nccsa the union government can easily veto the decision of cm of delhi consider this scenario since all decisions are taken by a majority vote in the nccsa if the chief secretary and principal home secretary takes a stand opposite to that of delhi government then their opinion will prevail over that of cm of delhi this is against the triple chain of command stated by the supreme court permanent executives like the chief secretary and principal home secretary are not accountable to the people so the ordinance and the nccsa breaks the triple chain of command secondly the ordinance goes against the article 239a of the constitution which provides the government model in delhi and also against the constitution bench judgment in the government of nct of delhi versus union of india 2018 thirdly the union government while presenting the ordinance mentioned that it is in accordance with the k balakrishnan committee recommendation but the fact is that k balakrishnan committee gave its recommendation in 1987 which was before the 69th constitutional amendment of 1991 that inserted the article 239 aa and framed the governance model for delhi so relying on the k balakrishnan committee is not logical these are some of the criticisms regarding the ordinance so what is the future of the ordinance see as you all know ordinance can also be challenged before the supreme court if at all this ordinance is challenged then the government must prove that an extraordinary or emergency situation existed that necessitated this ordinance if the supreme court is satisfied that the ordinance was enacted to serve the political ends that ordinance can be nullified this is in accordance with the supreme court judgment of dc vadva versus state of biha case in that judgment supreme court mentioned that power of the executive to promulgate an ordinance should not be perverted to serve political ends so let us wait and see if someone challenges the ordinance in the apex court that's all regarding this discussion in our discussion we saw about the recent judgment of supreme court regarding the accountability of officers of civil service in delhi the rationale behind the supreme court judgment the ordinance passed by the president the nccsa the criticism against the ordinance and finally the future of the ordinance now let us take up the next article for our discussion look at this article it says that ins sinduratna has written back after it underwent an update in russia see the ins sinduratna had gone for an upgrade in severodvinsk after a major accident in february 2014 that killed two officers in this context we will learn about ins sinduratna see ins sinduratna is a russian type 877 ekm diesel electric submarine it is also popularly called a nato defined kilo class submarine Basically it is a submarine that belongs to the Sindhu Ghosh class of diesel electric submarines it was commissioned into the indian navy on 24th february 1988 the submarine has a displacement of around 3000 tons and is powered by diesel electric propulsion it is equipped with various systems and weapons for surveillance warfare and self defense these includes torpedoes anti ship missiles and mines also ins sindhuratna has been actively involved in several naval exercises operations and deployments throughout its service in the indian navy it has contributed to maintaining maritime security conducting patrols and enhancing the country's naval capabilities but in 2014 ins sindhuratna was involved in an unfortunate accident because a fire broke out on board during training exercise and this resulted in the loss of lives and injuries to the crew so after this only the ship went for an upgrade this news article says that the ship has now returned back after the refit we'll also use this opportunity to quickly revise about project 75i see in june 1999 
the cabinet committee on security approved a 30 year plan to indigenously build and index 24 submarines by 2030. So, in the first place two lines of protection were to be established. The first is P75 and the second is P75I. Now, this project 75 India class submarines or P75I for short are a planned class of diesel electric submarines which are to be built for the Indian Navy. Under this Indian Navy intends to occur 6 conventional diesel electric attack submarines. The name of these 6 submarines are INS Kalwari, INS Kanderi, INS Karanj, INS Vela, INS Vagir and INS Vagshir. These submarines will also feature advanced capabilities including air independent propulsion, special operation forces, anti-ship warfare, anti-submarine warfare, anti-surface warfare, land attack capabilities and other features. Know that all these 6 submarines are expected to be constructed in India under the Make in India initiative. With this let us move on to our next article for the discussion. Look at this article here. It says that 122 delegates have arrived to India for the 3rd G20 Tourism Working Group Committee. Also it says that this meeting had the highest participation compared to previous gatherings. Besides this there was a side meeting on film tourism in which actor Ram Charan performed. The main meeting focused on promoting eco-tourism and sustainable tourism. This is the crux of this news article. In this context, we will use this opportunity to learn about G20, then we will see the significance of India's G20 presidency and finally, we will see what are the challenges for India ahead of the G20 summit. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here. Go through it. Now, let us see about G20. The G20 was created in 1999. It was created after a financial crisis that hit East Asia and Southeast Asia. So basically it aims to ensure global financial stability by involving middle income countries. The G20 countries together represent a big chunk of world. They make up 60% of the global population, 80% of the global GDP and 75% of the global trade. Talking of its membership, the G20 has 19 member countries and the European Union. The 19 member countries are Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Italy, Japan, Republic of Korea, Mexico, Russia, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Turkey, the United Kingdom and the United States. Know that the G20 presidency rotates every year among its members. Then you should also know about something called Trioka. The country holding the current presidency plus the previous presidency plus the next presidency holders forms the Trioka. This is to ensure continuity in the G20's agenda. So right now the Trioka consists of Indonesia the previous, Brazil the next and India the current presidency holder. In essence we can say that the primary mandate of G20 is international economic cooperation and it focuses on preventing future financial crisis worldwide. Now let us see why G20 presidency is significant for India. See, India is currently holding the G20 presidency, which means India is in charge of organizing and leading the G20 meetings and discussions. So, India will be hosting about 200 meetings in 32 different sectors all across the country. It will give India an exposure on the world stage. Then the main event of the G20 presidency is leaders summit. Here the heads of the state and the government from the member countries gather to discuss important global issues. For India, this summit will take place on September 9th and 10th in New Delhi. It is a crucial moment as the world leaders will come together and find solutions to pressing challenges. Also, India's presidency is an opportunity to share country's expertise in many areas like women empowerment, democracy and digital technologies. India can also demonstrate that conflicts can be resolved when democracy becomes ingrained in a society's culture. Then we know that India's foreign policy focuses on the global common good. So, through its leadership in the G20, India aims to address key global challenges arising from our interconnected world. These challenges include issues like climate change, new and emerging technologies, food and energy security and so on. India can find sustainable solutions that benefit all nations. Additionally, as we discussed earlier, during India's presidency, they will be joined by Indonesia and Brazil to form G20 Trioka. This is significant because it will be the first time the Trioka consists of three developing countries and emerging economies. It is hoped that this change will lead to a shift in the balance of power within the G20 and it would give emerging economies a greater say in decision making. We can also say that 
India can use the G20 presidency as an excellent opportunity to address the long standing issues that negatively affect developing countries. This is especially in areas like agriculture and food subsidies. Also by actively advocating for changes, India can correct the imbalances and promote a fairer global system. Overall, India's G20 presidency is a chance for us to contribute knowledge and experience to global discussions and shape the agenda around important issues. But India also faces several challenges that need to be addressed. We will see what are they one by one. One of the important key challenges is the disagreement over Russia-Ukraine conflict. India must find innovative solutions and build bridges to mend these differences. Secondly, to ensure unity and inclusiveness, India needs to develop an agenda that is agreeable to all member countries. So, internal governance reform is essential to promote cooperation and harmony among the G20 nations. This is not a very easy task. Thirdly, India also needs to collaborate with developed countries regarding climate financing. It is crucial to encourage these countries to transfer clean technologies and renewable energies to medium and low income nations. How we are going to do this is a big question. Then the ongoing pandemic had led to increasing global public debt and inflation. Public debt has reached an unprecedented high of 256% of the GDP. Besides this, the Ukraine war has disrupted the supply chain and further contributed to inflation. Therefore, addressing the public debt and inflation are among India's priorities. Adding to this, India must also continue the Indonesian agenda related to the health, digital transformation, green transition and microeconomic coordination. So, to tackle these challenges, India will collaborate with international organizations such as IMF, OECD, WTO and the Financial Stability Board. Finally, India needs to advocate for a code of conduct for all G20 members and also ensure its enforcement to maintain integrity of the forum. In summary, as the G20 president, India faces the task of addressing several internal conflicts, fostering unity, managing public debt and inflation and so on. So we can say that the collaboration with international organizations will be crucial in finding effective solutions to these challenges. That's all regarding this topic. Now let us move on to our next article. Look at this article here. It is about the third summit of FIPIC. It happened yesterday in Papua, New Guinea. In the summit, Modi said that small island nations of the Pacific Ocean are in fact the large ocean states. This is about the news article given here. Using this as an opportunity, we will learn about FIPIC and the outcomes of first two FIPIC summits. Now we will see FIPIC in detail. FIPIC is expanded as Forum for India Pacific Islands Cooperation. It was launched by our Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi during his visit to Fiji in November 2014. Know that it is a multinational grouping developed for cooperation between India and 14 Pacific Island nations. Those 14 islands include Cook Islands, Fiji, Kiribati, Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Nauru, Nuve, Samoa, Salomon Islands, Palau, Papua New Guinea, Tonga, Tuvalu and Vanuatu. See, if these islands are in Pacific Ocean, then it means they are far away from India. Then why India is having cooperation with these countries? This is because India's focus in the past has largely been on the Indian Ocean. In Indian Ocean only, India plays a major role and protects its strategic and commercial interests. Now this FIPIC initiative helps India to expand its engagement in the Pacific region as well. Along with this, the members of FIPIC have large exclusive economic zones. So they offer promising possibilities for fruitful cooperation in all aspects. These are two reasons why India is having a cooperation with these nations. The first meeting in 2014 is the first summit of FIPIC. After 2014, India had offered some major assistance projects. Some of the projects includes setting up of a special $1 million fund for adapting to climate change and clean energy. Then establishing Pan Pacific Islands e-network to improve digital connectivity. Then extending visa on arrival at Indian airports for all the 14 Pacific Island countries. Finally, training to diplomats from Pacific Island countries. These are the outcomes of the first summit. The second summit happened in Jaipur in August 2015. This summit has made significant progress in strengthening India's engagement with 14 Pacific Island countries. During the second summit of FIPIC, our Prime Minister announced FIPIC Trade Office at the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. That is FIKI. This is to promote the trade and investment opportunities between India and Pacific Island countries. To further strengthen this initiative, FIKI launched Business Accelerator for Forum for India-Pacific Islands Cooperation, that is FIPIC on 7th of September 2015. 
this is the outcome of second FIPIC summit. That's all. With this, let us move on to our next article. Take a look at this news article. As per the news article, a startup named Twitter Hyperloop incubated in IIT Madras have agreed to help the institute to develop an intellectual property in Hyperloop technology. So, in this context, let us understand what is Hyperloop and how it works. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted for your reference. You can pause the video and go through it. So, what is an Hyperloop? See, Hyperloop is an ultra-high-speed ground transportation system for passenger and cargo. This technology was proposed as a concept by Elon Musk, CEO of Tesla and SpaceX in a white paper back in 2013. Now, let us see how this technology works. See, Hyperloop technology consists of a long vacuum tube and it has a compartment like capsule. Those compartments are called pods. These pods run at a high speed inside the vacuum tube. These tubes are called loops. It mainly uses two types of technology that is air pressure and magnetic levitation. The air pressure technology depressurizes the tunnels and create a near vacuum environment where almost all of the air has been sucked out. This creates an environment where extremely high speeds are possible because there is minimal aerodynamic drag or wind resistance. The magnetic levitation causes each part to hover. Here, magnetic levitation, maglev or magnetic suspension is a method by which an object is suspended with no support other than the magnetic fields. Magnetic force is used to counteract the effects of gravitational acceleration and any other accelerations. How this magnetic levitation is attained is something interesting to know. See, the front corners of the train have magnets with north poles facing out and the back corners have magnets with south poles outwards. Electrifying the propulsion loops generates magnetic fields that both pull train forward from the front and push it from behind. This floating magnet design creates a smooth trip. So, magnetic levitation technology removes the ground friction of the wheels or tires that occurs in other modes of ground transportation. This technology is already being used in high speed bullet trains. In the image above, the magnets in the red are for levitation and propulsion. The magnets in the blue are for horizontal stabilization. So, to sum up, in hyperloop technology, there is very less friction between the pods and the tube and its speed is so fast that it leaves the maglev train too far behind. And since the transportation in the technology takes place in the loop itself, which means when passengers want to travel, they will travel through this loop. Hence, it is named as hyperloop technology. So far, we saw how an hyperloop works. Now, we shall see some of its advantages and disadvantages. Firstly, with fully electric and efficient operations, the system aims at being climate neutral over the course of its life cycle. Secondly, by connecting mobility hubs in large metropolitan areas, the door-to-door -door travel time is considerably reduced. Thirdly, contactless levitation and propulsion system as well as the low pressure environment allow the pod to travel efficiently at ultra high speeds. And finally, the running costs are lower than that of high speed train. It is feasible due to lower energy input. But maintenance issues have not been assessed. Now, some of its disadvantages includes collisions within the vacuum tubes. Even though it offers high speed, we still don't know the effect that extreme acceleration within an enclosed chamber will have on the human body. Apart from this, hyperloop part damage, tunnel decompression are some of its disadvantages or other concerns. That's all. With this, let us move on to our next article. This news article is about a statement made by the CM of Assam. He said that the Armed Forces Special Powers Act that is AFSPA is likely to be lifted from the Assam at the end of this year. He also mentioned that the military personnel would be roped to train the Assam police. This according to the CM will aid in the smoother transition from central police to Assam police battalions. This is about the news article. In this context, let us see some points about AFSPA. Armed Forces Special Power Act 1958 was a special legislation created to maintain peace in the disturbed areas. The objective of this act was to allow armed forces to aid the civilian administration in peace disturbed areas. Since its enactment, the act was made applicable not only to northeastern states and Jammu and Kashmir, but also to Punjab and Chandigarh as well. Here note that Jammu and Kashmir, Punjab and Chandigarh had separate armed forces special powers act. Now let us see which are all the areas where AFSPA is currently applicable. The areas include 30 plus districts in 4 different states of India. The states that are currently under AFSPA are Assam, Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland and Manipur. 
also see the union territory of jammu and kashmir has a separate armed forces jammu and kashmir special powers enacted in the year 1990 it was enacted in the wake of growing insurgency in the valley now let us look about the historical evolution of the current act afspa was first enacted in line with the ordinance of pre independence era called armed forces special powers ordinance of 1942 by now after looking at the year you would have guessed why the ordinance was enacted right it was the ordinance which was used by the british to suppress the quit india movement this is all with respect to background of the act now moving on to the important provisions of the act according to the act armed forces means the forces of the union government it doesn't include the state police forces the act under section 2b provides an area to be declared as disturbed area according to the act the whole or part of a state can be declared as a disturbed area now you may have a question who can declare certain areas as disturbed areas the answer to this question lies in section 3 of the act it says that the governor of a state or administrator in case of union territory or the union government can declare an area as disturbed areas now coming to the most important provision section 4 of the afspa deals with special powers conferred to the armed forces it allows even for a non commissioned officer to fire or use force even causing death against person who act against the law or orders in place at that time it also confers special powers to the armed forces to search and even arrest person based on mere suspicion the act also prohibits the assembly of five or more persons in the disturbed areas now coming to section 6 of the article it protects officers from civilian litigation against any act of them in the pursuance of this act this is all with respect to provision of the act moving on let us see about the significance of this act the act was enacted at an important time when the naga insurgency was at its peak in 1950s the act has aided the cause of armed forces in proactively maintaining an offensive stance against the hostile insurgents in the areas that has difficult terrain in times of growing calls to repeal the law we also have to remember that individual freedom has to be balanced with the freedom of other individuals and with reasonable demands of the community and the general public these are some of the significance of afspa now coming to the arguments against the law people of northeast view afspa as, as draconian in the famous case of extra judicial execution victims family association of manipur versus union of india it was contended that there were 1500 plus fake encounters in manipur taken place between 1980 to 2010 because of afspa apart from fake encounters there have been reported instances of sexual violations against women by the armed forces people of northeastern states want the afspa to be repealed to bring down the instances of these violations these are some of the points you need to know about afspa with this let us move on to our next article now look at the small article here it says that aringa ranna zoological park in chennai will have two young sloth bears from karnataka already there is one 13 year old lone sloth bear in the park the sloth bears were brought to zoo under an animal exchange program so in return aringa ranna zoological park has given two male and four female ostriches to karnataka this is about the news article given here using this opportunity now we will learn about the sloth bear in prelims perspective first of all tell me who all remember the movie zootopia when i said sloth bear i think some of you might have related the word with this character in the movie right if you relate sloth bear with this character then you are wrong this is sloth sloth bear looks like this the confusion is because of the name right the creature has its name because an european zoologist george shaw came across this animal and misunderstood this animal for its unique characteristics see this animal has long thick claws and unusual teeth he thought that the bear was related to the tree sloth due to these features so he placed this animal in the bradypodidae which is the sloth family later on only the nomenclature was changed and the animal is now placed in the ursidae the bear family that's how the animal got its name sloth bear see sloth bears are one of the eight bear species found across the world they mainly inhabit the region of india nepal sri lanka and bhutan This is about the habitat and the basic details of sloth bear. Now coming to its unique characteristics. Firstly, sloth bears have long, shaggy, dark brown or black fur. This is how it is differentiated from the normal black bears. See, the black bears have smoother and shorter fur. One more difference is that black bears also have more rounded ears, which is similar to that of a Mickey Mouse. Sloth bears have long unruly hair on their ears. 
secondly slot beers have curved claws they have the longest claws when compared to any other beer species this is exactly why zoologists assume these beers as slots but the usage is different slots use claws to hang on to trees but slot beers use their claws for digging thirdly about the diet of the slot beers slot beers have more in common with an ant eater than that of other beers of course it eats fruits and it is omnivorous but it also enjoys to eat termites ants insects etc as an adaptation to creepy diet the beer has few hairs on its nose and it can open and close its nostrils as needed this prevents the bugs from crawling up the beer's nose while it eats these are some of the unique characteristics of slot beer still there are many but we will see them in some other discussion with this let us move on to our next article for the discussion now this article here is about the manual scavenging in tamil nadu the article says that during a review meeting chief minister of tamil nadu mr stalin expressed concerns about the manual scavenging deaths he also said that most of the deaths took place in urban areas so he warned the officials to take measures to prevent such deaths this is the crux of the news article given here in this context now let us learn some basics about manual scavenging first of all let us see the definition of manual scavenger the prohibition of employment as manual scavengers and the rehabilitation act 2013 gives a detailed definition of manual scavenger i have given the definition here it says that manual scavenger is a person engaged or employed by an individual or local authority or an agency or a contractor for manually cleaning carrying disposing of or otherwise handling in any manner human excreta in an insanitary latrine or in an open drain or pit into which the human excreta from the insanitary latrines is disposed of or on a railway track or in such other spaces or premises as the central government or a state government may notify before the excreta fully decomposes so basically someone who is involved in cleaning human excreta manually from insanitary places are called as manual scavengers as we already saw before prohibition of employment as manual scavengers act was enacted in 2013 the act of manual scavenging is prohibited as per this act this is because manual scavenging is a very dangerous job in today's article also we saw that only see in certain cases manual scavenging causes death to avoid this government has conducted surveys in the year 2013 and 18 this survey is to identify the manual scavengers during the surveys 58098 eligible manual scavengers were identified the more recent data says that 188 persons have died due to accidents while undertaking hazardous cleaning of sewer and septic tanks during 2019 and 2022 remember these facts you can use this in your main answer c to prevent such situations and to rehabilitate the manual scavengers the government has taken many steps we saw about the act right according to the act it is the responsibility of the local authorities to ensure the conversion of insanitary latrines to sanitary ones this helps in reducing the employment as manual scavengers secondly an amount of rupees 266.16 crore has been spent by ministry of social justice and empowerment under the self employment scheme for rehabilitation of manual scavengers since 2013 the recent allocation to the scheme is rupees 70 crore that's all now let us move on to next part of our discussion that is practice prelims question discussion today we'll be having five questions i'll be solving four of them and one question will be a quiz question for you now let us take up our first question three statements about afspa are given and we have to find the correct ones the first statement is correct it can be implemented only after an area is declared as disturbed the second statement is also correct union government can declare an area as disturbed without the consent of the state government third statement is incorrect recently chaukam in arunachal pradesh has been declared as a disturbed area also note that afspa was lifted from tripura in 2015 and meghalaya in 2018 the correct answer for this question is option a 1 and 2 only with this let us move on to our next question this question is about fipic the first statement says that third summit of fipic happened in fiji in 2019 This statement is incorrect because yesterday only third summit happened in Papua New Guinea. The second statement says that business accelerator for FIPIC is an outcome of first summit of FIPIC. This statement is also incorrect because business accelerator for FIPIC is an outcome of second summit of FIPIC. The question asks for the correct statement. Here both the statements are wrong. So the correct answer here is option D. Neither one nor two. With this let us move on to our next question. In this question five submarines are given and we have to find 
which among them are diesel class submarines here the correct answer is option c 2 3 4 and 5 only INS Kalwari, Sinduratna, Vela and Vagir are diesel powered whereas INS Arihant is a nuclear submarine. INS Arihant is India's first indigenous nuclear powered ballistic missile capable submarine built under the secretive advanced technology vessel that is ATV project. So once again the answer here is option C 2, 3, 4 and 5 only. With this let us move on to our next question. Two statements about sloth beers are given and we have to find the correct ones. The first statement says that sloth beers use speed marking for communication. This particular statement is correct. See, sloth beers mostly live a solitary life, but they use a technique called speed marking to communicate during breeding season. Speed marking is a method of chemical communication that happens when the beer uses the pedal glands on its feet to secrete certain scents. Second statement says that sloth beers hibernate during winter season. This statement is incorrect. See, other beer species use dens for hibernation. But sloth beers do not hibernate, they sleep in caves and near rivers when available. Sloth beers tend to be nocturnal when living around humans, but without human disturbance nearby, they are often active during the day. So the correct answer for the question is option A, one only. This question is your quiz question. Read the question carefully and post your answers in the comment section. In this slides, mains practice questions are given, the interested aspirants can write their answers and post them in comment section as well. With this, we have come to end of our discussion. If you find this video useful, hit the like button, do comment and share it with fellow aspirants. And don't forget to subscribe Shankar AS Academy for more UPSC related content. Thanks for listening patiently. Have a nice day.